Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Inflation Reduction Act Tax Credits and Incentives Overview. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining. We're pleased to present our continuing professional education webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking Submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session offers one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy requirements. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of polling questions. To participate in the polls, please check the button next to your answer within the slide window and click Submit. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget and download your CPE certificate. Don't worry if you can't download your CPE certificate today, we'll email you a copy in two weeks. If attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our group CPE attendance sheet, available in our slide deck and handouts widget to receive credit. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. CPE credit can only be awarded to participants registered as themselves and isn't available for participants who view the on-demand version. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and with that, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams. Craig Lamlin, Director, Kyle Sund, Senior Manager, Irina Antonake, Managing Director, and Matt Caden, Managing Director. And with that, Craig, I will turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks very much. Um, just briefly going to put the agenda up front for everybody so you can take a look at it. Just from a, a perspective of a quick introduction, we're here talking about the Inflation Reduction Act, which was signed into law in August of 2020 by President Biden. Uh, the act was well over 700 pages. For people who have followed the legislative progress of this bill, you'll know it's very similar to Build Back Better. Uh, there are literally hundreds of billions of dollars in this legislation for uh, clean energy and incentives. Uh, there's a significant billions of dollars of grants, all of which will run through 2032. Uh, we expect, as do many observers, that this is going to result in trillions of dollars in domestic U.S. investment. So with that, um, we have a polling uh, question that we're going to kick it off with. If uh, Emily, we can read through that, please. All right. Our, our first polling question today, what aspect of the recent federal incentive legislation interests your organization the most? And we have a few options here. A, incentives for green buildings. B, incentives for renewable and energy production. C, incentives for carbon capture. D, incentives for advanced manufacturing. E, incentives for green fleet vehicles and or sustainable aviation fuels. F, how to document the tax credit bonus enhancements. G, how will direct pay or transferability provisions of IRA operate? H, the CHIPS Act and state initiatives. Or I, I am just here for CPE. So. I'll give everyone a moment to respond. To participate in our polls today, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And you may, with this one where it's a little long, you may need to uh, scroll down on the window to see all of the options. We'll just give it another couple seconds. All right, let's take a look at the results. Craig, back to you. 
All right. Thanks so much. All right. So we've got quite a, uh, well, we've got a quarter of the people here for CP. That's great. Hopefully we'll be able to interest you in some of the other options um, around green buildings, the renewable energy production. Um, there's a lot in this bill to unpack. And so with that, we're going to move along and we're going to start that. Um, all right. So let's talk about tax credit and enhancements. And this is sort of table setting for the other programs that we're going to discuss. Um, taxpayers can obtain a base credit when they meet certain requirements um, for placing, uh, pr excuse me, for placing um, property in service. Additionally, if they meet prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, they can be eligible for the full or bonus credit amount, which is five times the base. Now, you may say, well, what does that practically mean? So for a production tax credit uh, that would be generated in 2022, that would be 2.6 cents a kilowatt hour. And for an investment tax credit, that could mean you could achieve up to a 30% investment tax credits. Um, if the requirements are not met, the project would still be eligible for the base credit amount. Now, when we talk about prevailing wage, the reason this was included was to ensure that laborers and mechanics that are employed by the taxpayer or a contractor or a subcontractor are paid the prevailing wage in the locality where the project's being located. I think most people think that this prevailing wage requirement will be one that most taxpayers are able to meet. Um, it is going to require working with contractors and subcontractors to make sure that that's made, um, that that box is checked. The other consideration is from a compliance perspective, depending upon the type of project, um, you're going to have either subsequent alterations or repairs to the project following its placement in service. You need to make sure that the prevailing wage is still being paid at that point. Post placement in service period generally includes for investment tax credit purposes, the five-year period beginning on the date after the project was initially placed in service. In the case of a production tax credit or a section 45 carbon sequestration project, that's probably going to be the entire applicable credit period, which can be an extended period of time. When we look to the apprenticeship requirement, uh, the, this is the, sort of the second prong that a taxpayer needs to meet in order to meet the bonus rates. Uh, they have to make sure as a taxpayer that no fewer than the applicable percentage of total labor hours are performed by qualified apprentices. Uh, this percentage amount gonna, is going to start at 10% for projects beginning construction uh, before 2023, and that's going to increase over time. Uh, apprenticeship programs have to be qualified by the Department of Labor. Uh, and we're talking to a lot of clients right now that may that are considering taking steps in the coming months to begin construction of their projects. And the reason for that is they want to begin construction in advance of these requirements being mandated. So, for instance, the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements will be deemed satisfied for projects that begin construction prior to the date that is 60 days after the IRS publishes the relevant guidance for those um, prongs of the test. And right now the IRS is obtaining feedback from all sorts of industry players as to what that should look like. We do anticipate that we will have guidance by the end of the year to the extent that some of these are not met, whether it's prevailing wage or the apprenticeship requirement, there will be a curing process that will be available to taxpayers. There are also a couple additional things that taxpayers can do in order to increase uh, the total benefit of the programs. So for instance, there's domestic content. The domestic content provision requires that a certain percentage of the total cost of components in a project are mined, produced, or manufactured in the US. Um, the IRA framework sets this at 40% for most facilities um, from a manufacturing perspective, 20% for offshore wind facilities. Now, what does this get you? It gets you an extra 10% of the credit. Um, there are going to be some catch-up issues that we have identified. And, you know, as a general perspective, I think many observers think U.S. manufacturing is going to need some time to catch up to making all of these products in the U.S., 
but there are some exceptions that are available um, from a taxpayer perspective if domestic content is unavailable or if it's prohibitively expensive for the overall project. Another enhancement is locating a project in an energy com uh, community. In that case, the credit value is increased by 10% for facilities that are constructed in an energy community. And you may say, well, what does that mean? Well, that could be a brownfield site. That could be an area with significant unemployment. Um, we are waiting for additional guidance from the IRS to help define that. Um, and also we're looking at communities where coal mine is closed or coal fire electric generating unit has been retired. The last opportunity would be to locate a project in a low income community. This increases the credit by an additional 10% if the project's located in a low income community or in an Indian reservation. And there's an additional 20% if the project's located in a qualifying low income residential project or a low income economic benefit project. Those are generally going to be smaller projects. Um, so a typical example of what we are seeing and we're seeing our clients bring to us would be that of a solar ITC. So if that project qualified to start with the full base amount and bonus amount of the credit, that would get the taxpayer to 30%. If it's located in an energy community, that would add another 10% to the credit, so you're at 40%. And then lastly, if the taxpayer is able to satisfy the domestic content requirement, that project could qualify for an ITC of up to 50% of the eligible basis. You know, that's a very significant potential benefit. There are some um, exemptions that are worth noting. If your project um, has less than one, kilo, one megawatt um, of total energy, that is a project that is deemed to have met these requirements. Um, also, again, as we noted, if you begin construction before the Treasury guidance, um, within the 60-day window after that is initiated, you can, you're can you deemed to have met that criteria. So with that, we have another polling question. Does your organization plan on utilizing one or more of the IRA bonus enhancements? A wage and apprenticeship, A, B, domestic contact, C, energy communities, D, low income communities, um, or E, one or more of these provisions. These are really gonna be key to getting the full benefits out of these particular programs. So very interested to see what people are saying in terms of what they think they're gonna be able to achieve with these. Just give it a moment. A couple more seconds here, and then just a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's presentation, you'll need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. We are on our second polling question. All right, let's go ahead and see what everyone had to say. Back there you, to you go. So here we go. I think what this demonstrates is the additional guidance that's going to be presented by the IRS is going to be very helpful to make sure wage and apprenticeship, domestic content, and all the other potential benefits that can enhance these credits are properly documented at the time that the project is placed in service. So with that, turn it over to Kyle. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about two different green building incentives that were part of the IRA bill. Um, and quite uh, prominent changes to, to both of these uh, energy incentives. Uh, first one I'm going to talk about is Section 179B. So a little background about 179D. This, this is otherwise known as Energy Efficient Commercial Building Deduction. It was made a permanent part of the tax code towards the end of 2022. And the deduction is available for newly constructed commercial buildings or building improvements that are placed in service after January 1st, 2006. So we have a really long window of looking at this, this incentive. And now that Section 179 is permanent, it provides a really great opportunity for ongoing tax benefits for taxpayers that can plan for and, and claim the deduction. 
uh, which obviously there's enhancements related to the IRA bill but I, that I'll talk about on the next slide. So the deduction as it currently stands today through the end of 2022 is up to $1.88 per square foot of the building area. Um, it, that's been inflation adjusted. So previously in 2020, it was $1.80 per square foot. Uh, both building owners and designers can claim the deduction. So this would be you know, the owners and tenants of commercial properties uh, or owners of residential properties if the, if the buildings are four stories or greater. Um, and, and that third group, kind of in the bottom right corner of the slide, it's the designers of government buildings, such as architects, engineers, and, and in certain cases, contractors, can get the deduction uh, allocated to them by the government entity. And I apologize if you're getting a little bit of feedback. I, I have uh, people doing some work at my house outside, so I apologize for that if you're getting any sort of extra noise. Um, and the, the last piece that's really important is that uh, for the tax code, it's a requirement that the energy modeling must be completed by a qualified third party. And then the energy modeling has to be certified by a professional engineer or a licensed contractor, you know, who's licensed in the state where the building's located um, in order to claim the deduction. So now, now we'll talk about uh, some of the changes in the IRA bill as it relates to section 179B. Uh, one of the eligible uh, groups now that can take advantage of 179B are REITs. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned the, the designers of, of government buildings, architects, engineers, and in certain cases, contractors. Um, instead of just being able to take the deduction for design work that they're doing for government buildings, uh, they can also take uh, now with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, they can now get the deduction allocated to them by uh, nonprofit or tax exempt organizations, including private K through 12 uh, schools or universities, churches and other religious institutions, and then, and then tribal organizations. So pretty major expansion of, of uh, you know, who can, who can take advantage of 179D and, and for what work. You know, another big change with 179D is, you know, I mentioned the, the dollar per square foot amount. It currently is at $1.88 per square foot. That's through the end of, for property this place and service through the end of 2022. Beginning January 1st, 2023 for the property place and service, you know, in, that, in 2023 tax year or later, uh, we now move into this base deduction or bonus deduction. And, you know, Craig, you know, talked about the prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, which you know, allows taxpayers to take advantage of the, the bonus deduction uh, framework of the IRA bill. And it's a really important uh, piece of, of um, the dollar amount that can be applied for Section 179D. So with the base deduction, if you don't hit the prevailing wage or apprenticeship requirements, the deduction is uh, 50 cents per square foot for energy savings of 25% on a sliding scale up to a dollar per square foot for energy savings of 50% 50, uh, 50 or greater. That sliding scale increases to 250 per square foot, up to five dollars a square foot. So it's a significant change, uh, very important. You know, again, as Craig alluded to, that um, you know the taxpayers are, are meeting those requirements in order to take the bonus deduction, um, just because of the increased dollar amount. You know, a, another major component, um, which I think has slid under the radar a little bit, is the deduction cap. So previously, when uh, taxpayers uh, you know, claim a 179D deduction for a specific building, that, that building in its current format is, is done. That 179D cannot be taken on that building again. One of the updates um, in, the, in the IRA bill is that the, there's a three-year cap now. So, you know, if you think of renovation projects on, let's say, a you know, university building or a, you know, K through 12 public school building, you know, if 179D had been taken on that building, you know, five years ago, under the old law, that building is done. In the new law, it, as long as there's this three-year window, you can actually, if there's another renovation project that comes a little further down the down in the, that time frame, um, now taxpayers can take advantage of it. So whether that's a designer or for a commercial property, maybe you have a newly constructed building that was built 10 years ago that 179D was taken on, and then you do a renovation project now or in 2023, um, you know, looking forward, you can take advantage of it again. So, you know, the, we have to look at ASHRAE standards for 
179 D as it relates to energy modeling. So, uh, so there was just a time frame change on on which ASHRAE standard to use with 179 D. And then again, you know, I talk about this dollar amount on the sliding scale of the 250 a square foot up to five dollars a square foot. Um, it, it makes makes a huge change. Um, you know, getting that getting that bonus deduction. You know, and again, it's it's meeting that local prevailing wage, and then also the apprenticeship requirements, which, uh, you know, moving forward is going to be up to fifteen uh, percent of labor hours for those on site. And again, we don't know exactly where this is going to head um, from Treasury and kind of what what it looks like. And you know, we get a lot of questions from our clients that are architects, engineering engineering firms, and contractors that are claiming the deduction as as a designer, and in some cases, they don't have control over what um, you know, the workers are being paid from a prevailing wage uh, perspective or from the apprenticeship program. And so we, uh, we don't know where that's going to head for, for those clients that, um, that are looking at claiming 179D, but um, it's, it's something that's, that's very important. And again, as, as long as these, um, that these construction projects are underway right now, you know, they're going to be, um, be able to get the, the bonus deductions we move through to 2023 and 2024, um, as long as they've already started construction prior to this guidance being issued. So the next uh, green building incentive I'm, I'm going to talk about is Section 45L. This is uh, the energy efficient home credit, and it previously it expired at the end of 2021. Um, it, as a part of the IRA bill, it was extended in its current format through the end of 2022. And then it was modified beginning in 2023. So I'm, I'm going to talk about the modifications on the next slide. This slide is just talking about what it looks like through the end of this year for, um, you know, newly constructed or improved properties that, that were placed in service in 2022. So the existing credit is $2,000 per unit uh, for single family home builders, multifamily developers, and uh, manufactured home developers that construct or substantially renovate residential properties that are three stories or less. Um, and, you know, you must reduce energy consumption by 50% or more. And then the tax credit is generated and, and taken by the taxpayer in the tax year where the, the unit is sold, leased, or rented. So, you know, think a single family home, you know, that home is sold, you know, maybe there's a, a large development and there's 40 homes if 20 are sold in uh, 2021, 20 or sold in 2022, you take uh, 20 units in that 2021 tax year and 20 units in the 2022 tax year. Uh, the credit can also be uh, claimed uh, not only in the current year, but also on a look back basis by amending uh, tax returns, typically three years um, in the past. And so it, it can be claimed retroactively, but you know, Definitely something that you want to talk to your, you know, tax provider about to make sure that you can actually go back in time and, and claim this, uh, this credit. So I mentioned that uh, 45L was modified significantly in the IRA bill, um, and these changes begin in 2023. Uh, it also extended out the credit to all the way to 2032. So you'll note in this chart on the slide that the first column is, is the credit amount through the end of 2022. And then the, the next four columns are the credit amount changes as a part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, you know, an, another um, you know, significant change to 45L is that uh, we have different energy certification requirements. So there's a few new uh, Department of Energy programs specific to single family homes manufactured homes and multifamily construction projects. There's also an optional DOE program for zero energy ready homes that can be used uh, to enhance the 45L credit amount as you, as you notice in the chart. And lastly, one other significant change for 45L is that beginning in 2023, multifamily properties, four stories or greater are now eligible to, to claim the tax credit. And it also can be used in parallel with 179D, which I talked about on the, on the previous couple of slides. And now I think I'm going to pass it on to Arena. Thanks, Kyle. Um, next, we are going to be talking about the direct pay and transferability options of the IRA, which are new concepts to, to the federal world. 
And I think the next, it's, we have a polling question. Um, all right. Our See if third, anybody... polling, <laughs> third polling question, uh, who can qualify for the direct pay option? And your options are A, only non-taxable entities, B, only taxable entities, or C, both, depending on the type of credit. So we'll give everyone a moment or two to think about this. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you may download that from the slide deck and handouts widget. We'll also be sending a copy of the slides and a recording of the presentation uh, to all registrants tomorrow. So we'll give everyone just another second here. All right, still have some responses coming in. All right, let's go ahead and see what everyone has to say. Irina, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so the correct answer was C, both depending on the type of credit. And we'll move to that slide right now and go through that. So the direct pay option, um, as you see, is section 6417 of the IRA. Um, it's really just a refundability option. And um, however, it does, in general, apply to tax-exempt entities, state and local governments. You can see the list on here. Except for um, credits under 45V, Q, and X, that is allowed as a direct pay option to tax-paying entities at, as well. And so um, for those three credits, kind of anyone that qualifies could select this refundability option. And you can see down below all of the credits um, the direct pay applies to. One thing that did not make it on the slide um, is there is an actual phase out and the refundability percentage goes down if you don't meet the domestic content requirements. I think it goes, it starts going down in 23 or 24, I'm sorry, 25, and then it'll phase out entirely. And so um, definitely something obviously we are pushing as uh, as part of the IRA is making sure that we're meeting this domestic content and really bringing bringing production and manufacturing home. And so the timing for this refundability, it appears at this point that you have to claim it on your tax return. And so as far as timing is concerned, at, without any of the guidance yet, we would expect that you will have to file your tax return after you've qualified for the credit in the year in which you place a project in service, and then you would get a refund after filing your return. Now, the transferability option is something very new. If any of you are aware and familiar with state tax credits, transferability is fairly common on the state side. And um, generally, you transfer a credit is treated as a capital asset type of sale, and you use it to offset your tax liability. Mm -hmm. And it appears that the federal government is wanting to implement something um, more straightforward than what we have had so far on the federal side. Some of you may be aware the only way you can quote unquote monetize or transfer federal tax credits currently, it's through um, tax equity. And Matt Caden's gonna address that a little bit um, later in the presentation. But this option basically allows you to complete your project and then transfer your credit to a third party. Um, it's a one-time transfer and the transferee basically steps into your shoes as far as kind of risks and recapture for the project if things do go sideways. Um, and they, um, they basically just get the credit the same way and use it the same way you would use it. You can carry it back three years, carry it forward 20. And um, you as a, say, seller of the credit have until the due date of your return, including extensions, to make that election. And also 180 days after the enactment of the IRA, which puts us, say, about mid-February um, until you can make that election. But we're expecting you know, that shouldn't be an issue for most companies. What um, we don't really know, <laughs> because this is such a new concept for the federal government, is really the transfer process and procedures. If some of you remember about 10 years ago, there was an ITC grant option that you could basically take your ITC credits and convert them into a grant and get cash. We would expect somewhat similar um, procedures where you probably have to have a cost audit of the basis, probably audits of 
the apprenticeship and wage requirements, just really, you know, documenting everything is qualified and properly, you know, the basis and the amount of credit that you're entitled to. The other things that come into play would be purchase and sale agreements between a buyer and seller, indemnities and guarantees. Keep in mind the buyer is now going to be subject to recapture should something happen with the project. And so trade credit insurance is something that has already been discussed in the industry. You know, there are some insurance companies that may be willing to insure against this recapture risk or perhaps even other risks related to these um, to these projects that could cause a recapture event. The other um, question that remains open is <clears throat> what type of credit, I'm sorry, what type of income can you offset, especially for individuals? Is it just passive activity income or is it portfolio income or is it W-2 income? And so obviously that changes, you know, the marketplace quite a bit and who is eligible or who would want to participate in this program. As far as the corporate tax, we would expect that the minimum tax, um, it applies to the minimum tax that is part of the IRA and then still a 75% um, offset limitation against your actual tax liability. And then, um, both, so the, the direct pay and or the transferability is not considered income to, to the seller or to the person receiving the direct pay. And so with that, we don't know how the states will treat this. We will have to wait and see whether states will um, adopt the IRA provisions or whether they'll decouple. And then you may have state income tax implications from the sale of these credits. And so these are all things that um, we are anxiously waiting to see what happens. We are providing comments um, to the IRS and Treasury regarding some of these questions and just anticipate um, hopefully having really good procedures in place to make sure that everything is kind of clear and, and properly tracked. And so with that, I think we are moving on to clean energy credits. Great, thanks, Arena. Um, Matt Caden, Managing Director at Moss Adams, is gonna walk you through some of the new uh, clean energy credit incentives. Um, sort of realize going through the deck that, um, <laughs> just realized going through the deck that there's probably you know a variety of uh, sort of familiarity with these credits. And so just wanted to give, before we sort of get into the, the slides that we prepared, just wanted to give a quick primer um, on sort of what we're talking about in the next few slides. So uh, you sort of have two types of uh, credit incentives here. You've got investment tax credits, which we denote as ITC. Um, these are based on the cost of eligible property. So solar panels, hydropower facilities, biomass facilities, et cetera, um, sort of pretty much everything before the transmission phase. So everything sort of in the generation phase of that electricity, all those costs are more or less gonna go into that ITC eligible cost. And then you're gonna get the benefit of a, a credit that's calculated on a percentage of that eligible cost. And when the credit is earned, it's earned when that property or that facility is placed in service. Um, so when it starts commercial operations, essentially. Um, for the ITC, there's a five-year recapture period, uh, which is important to note. So, you know, often if you're, uh, doing a tax equity transaction, which is sort of one of the ways these things are financed, or if you are um, selling your tax credits or, or, or you know, even, even direct pay, you have to be aware that there is this potential liability or recapture uh, if the facility is sold or uh, disposed of, and that can include like being sort of destroyed in a fire or um, sort of stops operations. Um, anything like that is going to cause a recapture of a portion um, or all of the ITC, depending on when that happens. Um, currently, ITC is subject to reduction for uh, certain tax-exempt ownership. Uh, one of the important things the IRA changed is it sort of does allow um, for direct ownership uh, of these things by tax exempts. But um, if you're in sort of a tax equity structure, you have to be wary of um, still, even after the IRA, of tax exempt entities up the chain because they can impact the ITC. Um, and again, an important feature of the ITC is that you can sort of own an op, different parties can own and operate it. So you can own the solar facility and claim the ITC on it. Then you can lease the facility to somebody else and it doesn't impact the, the ITC. 
you can also pass that credit through to the lessee under sort of ex existing law or pre-IRA law, which continues to be relevant. Um, PTCs or production tax credits, like the name suggests, it's based on, not on investment, but on your production, the facility, uh, the facility's production. So you have, I'm going to talk about the renewable production tax credits, which basically are calculated based on a, a megawatt hour or a kilowatt hour of, of electricity generated. Um, the credit starts essentially, you know, the, you have a 10 year period. Um, from when you place it in service. So it's not sort of a one-time upfront credit. You sort of receive it annually. And so that, that sort of impacts uh, the financing of it. Um, you know, where, where the ITC, the investor is getting it right up front, uh, the, the investor uh, or someone that's buying your credits, they, they sort of, you know, won't be able to give you the money perhaps all up front uh, with the PTC because that, that credit's going to be earned over time. Um, there's no recapture with PTC. Um, so that's that's good. Um, and it's not subject to reduction for tax exempt ownership in the tax equity structures. Um, one one important uh, element of current law uh, is that it must be owned and operated by the same party. So you can't sort of have that leasing structure I mentioned. And another factor is that um, the the facility uh, itself. Um, Again, can't 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 be it has to be owned and operated by the same party. So that puts a restriction on it, and, and the power has to be sold to an unrelated party to claim PTCs under 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 this law, um, which is different from the ITC, which is unrestricted in that regard. So we're here because of the IRA. The IRA makes four big changes. Um, it makes changes that are relevant to uh, cap to long-term capital planning and investment, and that is that the PTC and ITC have been ex. ex Ex, um, expanded at their sort of highest rate. So that's, um, you know, 20 something dollars for PTCs and 30% for ITC through at least 2033. And so that's going to allow people to sort of make their plans, their capital allocations, their financing decisions on a more sort of stable foundation than uh, under previous law, which sort of had a phase down um, of those amounts sort of as, as, the, as the years went by. So I think that's going to allow for a lot more investment and sort of uh, reduce friction in the market. Um, the other big thing is that you sort of have the ability to elect uh, ITC and PTC on solar and other technologies. Um, and so that's really interesting because now you have to kind of look at this analysis where you're, you're deciding, okay, is my value, is my credit value more in the cost of my facility? Is it more in what we're going to generate? Um, and so, you know, for a lot of projects that maybe get really good wind resource or really good sun in, in you know, Southern California, for example, um, the PTC is probably going to be really strong there. Um, and so uh, I think that's a really important analysis and really the one of the fundamental changes here of the IRA that's going to benefit the industry. The other is the expansion of the ITC. Um, to energy storage, which is a, you can't sort of get all these renewables onto the grid because they are intermittent resources. The sun doesn't shine at night, so you need uh, battery storage to sort of fill in the gap. And now you can have battery storage sort of charged by things other than solar and uh, wind. Now it can be charged by the grid itself, which is gonna allow for a lot more investment uh, in energy storage, which is, which is great. The, the ITC was also expanded to biogas in microgrid control controllers, um, which we're seeing a lot of activity in those markets. And so that's exciting as well. Um, some other big changes already discussed, the bonus credits, direct pay. So moving on to slide 27, talking about the production tax credit. Just some quick rules here. Um, again, the period we're talking about here is 22 uh, through, start, through start of construction, 25. Um, the facilities we're talking about, solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, biomass. Um, PTC rate uh, is an interesting one. If you read the statute, I think the way that it's calculated, you get to an answer of $27.50 a megawatt hour, and then it's indexed to inflation thereafter. Some say that was a mistake, and they're going to fix it. Um, they're going to revert to $26 a megawatt hour. Um, we're going to have to watch that. It's one of the sort of uncertain areas uh, that, that Marina mentioned going forward. A um, little bit more on the PTC, you know, we talked about wage and apprenticeship. So start of construction is important. Um, if you start construction, 
before those regulations are issued uh, or within 59 days after they're issued, um, you can uh, not you can avoid those requirements, which is which is a nice feature. Um, I mean, people should be paid, but uh, just if, if your economics depend on it, um, you know, you do have that option of sort of starting construction early. And starting construction is a term of art um, that's a bit complicated, probably requires some analysis, but it, it's not sort of, doesn't necessarily mean major construction. It can be sort of something quite a bit less than that. So that's an important feature. And then the bonus credits, which have been discussed. One thing to mention is that the PTC bonus is a is a percentage increase, and so if a credit is thirty dollars a megawatt hour, a ten percent increase under one of the bonus provisions will, will net thirty three dollars a megawatt hour. Um, can move on to the uh, to the ITC. You'll see that that's different. It's it's thirty percent of eligible costs, but your bonus credits are ten percentage points. So if you qualify for one of the bonuses, you'd go to forty or fifty percent if you qualify for multiple. Uh, of those bonuses. Um, so that's, that's a big economic driver, sort of talking about that decision point between claiming ITC or PTC on these assets. Um, one other thing, you know, as we noted, the main thing here is standalone storage. I mean, the ability to store energy and, and deploy it at different times of the day and to get an investment tax credit on that is new uh, when it's charged by sort of non-solar or wind resources. And so that is a really big uh, benefit and boon to the renewable grid. Um, you know, th there was some excitement here, it's probably worth noting that a major law firm had mentioned that maybe you wouldn't be able to claim PTC on a solar project, for example, that is charging the battery that's taking ITC. Um, and so fortunately, uh, comments uh, made by Representative Neal, who's chairman of the House Ways and Means, uh, he clarified that you would be able to take PTC on something that's charging the battery uh, that's claiming ITC, so that's that's very helpful, and that's gonna that's gonna really create a lot of value. Um, so move quickly to a polling question. All right, our next polling question, our final polling question: Which of the following solar projects would be the best candidate for electing PTC? And your options are A, located in a wealthy suburb of Phoenix with affordable foreign-made components. B, located in a wealthy suburb of Seattle with affordable foreign-made components, or C, located in the Arizona desert with in a low-income area with components made in the USA. So we'll give everyone a minute to think on that. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window. Just another few seconds here. Still got some answers coming in. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you, Matt. Okay, this is interesting results. Um, so I guess the what we're asking here uh, is we're, we're sort of getting to that decision point between PTC and ITC. And so generally, if your cost is low and your generation, i.e. your solar resource is very high, you're, you're probably going to want to lean towards the, the PTC, particularly when there's no bonus credits, when you're not in an energy community or a low income community um, or, or, thing, or, uh, or you're not meeting the domestic content requirements. So if, if none of those things are true, um, I think probably A actually would be uh, the best for electing PTC through a little bit of a curveball there, um, seeing who's still awake. So uh, moving on to slide, uh, the next slide, nuclear. Um, look, uh, law of averages suggests that there are few, if any, here for the nuclear credit. Um, it's similar to the operation of the PTC we already discussed. Um, the main thing is what's different from the others is that um, in the third bullet, you'll see there's sort of a formula. Essentially, as the price of nuclear energy gets very high um, and, and the, the owner of that facility is earning a tremendous return just on, on electricity revenues, that PTC ratchets down. So to avoid sort of a, a windfall effect, which, which can happen. Um, so we'll move on to the clean energy credits. We'll breeze through those. This is sort of the regime that applies after uh, the end of 24. Um, again, sort of very similar to PTC and ITC. 
uh, it's it's technology neutral. So whether it's a PTC or an ITC, as long as it's not emitting emissions or it's a, a zero emission facility in the language of the statute, um, it's going to qualify for at your election PTC or ITC. Um, and so that's a great great thing for future technologies that aren't on the scene yet. They'll just sort of, as long as there's zero emissions, they will fit into these uh, categories after 24. A um, couple things to note, you know, the, the PTC can be sold to a related party, unlike uh, under sort of regular PTC rules. And the recapture period is longer here. It's 10 years because they want to track to see if your emissions are, are truly um, zero. Um, so that's probably enough to say on that. Those two carbon oxide sequestration. Um, so this is a big deal, um, particularly for anyone in the oil and gas industry. Um, you know, this is this is really a, a lucrative credit. Um, it was before. I think they, the government, got feedback that it wasn't lucrative enough, and so they've really uh, blown the roof off uh, with the with the value on this thing. So, um, you know, I think the just before getting into the content of the slide, I mean, I, I think a few third parties have said that this market by the end of 25 is going to be bigger than the solar and wind, you know, PTC and ITC. Um, so tremendous investment coming um, in this area. Essentially what it is, is it's tax credits that are earned by parties that capture carbon oxides, um, which if you're not a chemistry major, and I'm not, um, is basically carbon dioxide. It does not include methane, which is another thing that people capture, but it doesn't qualify for these credits. Uh, it has to be captured and then sequestered underground, number one, uh, or or uh, utilized in enhanced oil or natural gas recovery and then stored underground. Um, and it can also be utilized uh, in certain ways um, in certain commercial markets. And so what, what they're trying to do there with that third category is to the extent a pr an industrial process needs carbon dioxide, um, if you're sort of taking carbon dioxide from an emitter and you're transporting it to that other user, you're sort of taking some carbon dioxide out of the system. Um, and so uh, they, they do give you credit for utilizing it or, or in, in an industrial process, as long as it's a commercial market and you're not just doing it to, to sort of get the benefit of the credit. Um, one of the things that people are a little uh, unsure about is what is carbon capture equipment, because that's one of the requirements. Essentially, it's it's what it sounds like. It's it's equipment. It's heavy equipment. It's it's gas lines, pipelines, and things like that um, to capture the equipment. It's not trees. You know, a lot of people asking about forestation, uh, which obviously uh, captures carbon in a way, um, but uh, it, it's not it's not reforestation, afforestation, or any natural process that removes CO two. It it has to be sort of using equipment. Um, and again, it's a game changer. It's it's a twelve year period of PTCs. They jacked up the credits by two to three times what it was under prior law. Uh, the credits, um, unlike the PTC and ITC, which can only be direct paid by uh, tax exempt parties. Now, any party that owns these facilities, or you, even if they're taxable, they can take direct pay. They can also sell the credits. Um, you know, tax equity could be beneficial as well because uh, you can monetize depreciation and tax equity. Um, but it's nice to know that there's these fallback options uh, for carbon capture, uh, meaning the direct pay and the transferability. So I really expect this to be a really big piece of this moving forward, particularly for those already sort of in the oil and gas industry. That's all we had on that. Turn it over to the next presenter. Thanks, Matt. Um, so let's take a look at 48C. This is a credit that has been reauthorized. It reinstitutes the application credit for 40, Section 48C for advanced energy projects. So in this particular case, there's two buckets of funding, a total of 10 billion, 4 billion of which is reserved for projects located in energy communities. Uh, Section 48C credit is subject to a competitive application process that's going to be jointly administered by the IRS and the Department of Energy. So um, for taxpayers that um, can obtain a base credit of 6%, and then if they meet the prevailing wage and the apprenticeship requirements become eligible for the full bonus credit amount of 30%. 
Uh, the credit's based on eligible costs associated with a qualified advanced energy project. Um, the act defines a whole bunch of things. What we're seeing our clients talk to us most frequently about is property designed to be used to produce energy from the sun, from water, from wind, from geothermal deposits. You know, as Matt had alluded to, fuel cells, that's a huge thing. Um, the ability to store energy, that's, and the components of those will qualify for this. Um, also, micro turbines and, as I said, energy storage systems, which are going to be absolutely critical. Um, taxpayers can't claim this credit until they receive an allocation award and a project certification letter from the IRS. So there will be some time lag related to this. Um, after receiving the certification, an applicant will have two years to place the property in service. Um, as noted on this slide, there are a number of credits that if you opt to take 48C, you're not going to be able to take. So we uh, avoid issues around double dipping as it relates to that. The next credit we want to talk about is 45X for advanced manufacturing production. Um, the Act adds this credit, which provides a production tax credit for manufacturers of eligible components that are produced and sold by a taxpayer to an unrelated party after 2022. Uh, the credit amount varies on the eligible component that's being produced. Uh, this includes solar energy components, wind energy components, certain inverters, qualifying battery components, and there are also applicable critical materials that can fall into a qualified category. Um, it does appear that a manufacturer can simultaneously qualify both for the advanced manufacturing production credit under 45X that we're talking about and uh, the advanced energy project credit under 48C that was on the prior slide. Um, this credit begins to phase out in 2030 and is not available for components that are sold after 2032. So let's move on to transportation and fuel credits. Um, you know, this one, I think it goes without saying, this is the opportunity for businesses that have considered uh, purchasing commercial clean vehicles to have an opportunity of assistance um, from the government through this particular section. Um, it's a section 45W. It's available for qualified commercial vehicles acquired after 2022. Um, a qualified commercial vehicle must be made by a manufacturer and acquired for use or lease by the taxpayer. It has to be depreciable. Um, the credit is capped at either $7,500 or $40,000, depending upon the size of the vehicle. Uh, this is one that we think um, you know, has potentially significant large implications for our client base um, who are going to be looking to move in the clean energy commercial fleet space. Um, then we get into some sustainable aviation fuels, and this is sort of a two-parter. So Section 40B creates a refundable blender's credit for each gallon of sustainable aviation fuel sold as part of a qualified mixture starting in 2023. This credit operates on a sliding scale, and you know it varies between $1.25 to $1.75 based on the fuel's reduction in life cycle greenhouse emissions over 50%. Uh, taxpayers will have to certify the fuel reduces emissions by at least 50%. So obviously there'll be some compliance. This only applies to fuel sold or used in 2023 and 24. After this, the credit switches to a tech neutral version. Um, and we're just going to just jump ahead one slide to 45Z. This is the credit that falls on uh, the clean fuel production credit. It creates a production credit equal to the amount per gallon of transportation fuel produced by a qualified facility in the U.S. sold during the taxable year and meeting certain emissions requirements. Uh, the base credit is 20 cents per gallon and the bonus is a dollar um, if the fuel is produced at a facility that meets prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements. For sustainable aviation fuel, the credit is 35 cents um, and it goes up to $1.75. Um, one thing that 
I mentioned at the beginning of this were grants. Um, the, infra the Inflation Reduction Act has about $66 billion of grants in it. Um, and I just wanted to highlight this particular one, the Alternative Fuel and Low Emissions Aviations Technology uh, Program. It's a competitive uh, program administered by the Department of Transportation to provide grants to eligible entities. Um, there's almost $300 million over a five-year period, 245 million of it are for projects related to production, transportation, lending, or storage of the sustainable aviation fuel. And then there's about 47 million that goes to projects related to low emission aviation technologies. And we would expect further guidance that's going to help us define that. Um, but again, the ultimate goal is to reduce um, aircraft emissions in this type of credit. All right, so let's go back a slide or two. Just want to touch briefly on Section 45V, the Clean Hydrogen Production Credit. Um, the Act adds this. It's a, two, it's a new two-tier inflation-adjusted 10-year production tax credit for clean hydrogen. Uh, qualified clean hydrogen is hydrogen produced through a process that results in a life cycle greenhouse gas emission. Uh, this will require an independent, unrelated third party to verify the amounts of hydrogen produced for the credit qualification purposes. Uh, no credit may be taken for qualified clean hydrogen produced at a facility that includes a carbon capture equipment, um, which is allowed under Section 45Q that Matt had discussed. However, a taxpayer who uses electricity produced at a production tax credit or type ITC eligible facility to produce clean hydrogen may claim both the production tax credit and the ITC on Section 45 production um, equipment. So with that, I think with the remaining minute or two that we have left, I'm going to turn it over to Emily. All right, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our presenters today, Craig, Kyle, Irina, and Matt for a great presentation. Um, we certainly covered a lot of material. And unfortunately, we are out of time for live Q&A. Um, I know we have a lot of questions that came in and we'll be doing our best to follow up with you after the presentation. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here's a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next time.